thank you everyone for coming along. Thank you for sitting at the front, most of you. Adam, I see you. Um, so, I'm Ben Ward, field CTO, UK and I at Liquid. The last time I did a presentation, yes, it was all about tea bags. I've got a, a slightly different theme <laughs> this time. I like to walk around across the stage, but obviously I need to stay here with the microphones this time, so I'm just going to jiggle around quite a lot. So, question. Does anyone remember what their first laptop was? Anyone want to volunteer their first laptop? Come on, it's got to be some... Not you. No, go on, Guy. What was your first laptop? Unix one. Of course it was. How big was it? About... Yeah. A Unix laptop. Okay, I didn't even know they made them. 1993. 1993? Okay. How old? I was, um, I was 11. Anyway, so my first laptop, in fact, was older than yours. This is a Commodore um, CT, C260 LT, uh, C286 LT. Have you ever seen one of these before? It might have been. It might have been. Um, so this thing was really old. A 286 processor, okay, it had a blue and gray monochrome screen, um, a 286 processor, and it ran Windows 3.0 until it upgraded it to Windows 3.1. That's how old this thing was. It was older than whatever you were running. RDI PowerLite, Yes. Um, so this is what we had, okay, and this is my stepdad's laptop, and he got this probably around about 1993, it was already out of date, it was second hand in 93, and he kept this for probably about 10 years, he was using this well into the 2000s. We had like a really powerful 486DX4 100 downstairs, we upgraded it to a Pentium, he didn't touch that thing because he had this, this crappy old 286 monochrome screen Windows 3.1 beast. And the reason he used this for so long was because it was convenient, okay? A laptop. He could open it up in his office at home. He could take it downstairs, sit at the kitchen table, open this thing up with his massive power brick because the battery never worked. He could go wherever he wanted to go and he could use this thing, okay? This is generally the theme of laptops. We all know this, don't we? Laptops, pretty cool inventions. Fast forward about 15 years or so. So I used to be the IT manager of this place. This is the big word, okay? So it's a Leeds company, translation services. When I was there, I had about 500 people, 100 million turnover, and for some reason they made me the IT manager, not for very long. Um, so I was in charge of lots of laptops, global team, lots of devices, and I decided it would be a really, really good idea to let people decide whether or not they had laptops, okay? So I said, hey, everyone, if you want a laptop, come and justify it to me, and I will probably give you a laptop. We had about 100 people over space about six months, and this is probably about 2009, 2010. They came to me and said, Ben, I need a laptop. Can I have a laptop? Most of the time it was yes. So we gave out about 100 laptops, probably about 1,000 pounds a time. These were quite expensive laptops. And at the end of it, um, I ran into massive, massive issues. And the reason I ran into massive issues was because it was 2009. We had Windows 7 deployed everywhere. Does anyone remember when OMA <laughs> was first introduced into Windows. Nobody? Windows 8.1 was the first time you could really, really manage Windows over the air with OMA DM. That was the first time it was implemented. If you had Windows 7 on your endpoints, you were pretty much stuck. Unless you had SCCM, we didn't. I was really, really tight with cash, unless it was a laptop. We didn't have SCCM, we had group policy. We used group policy to deploy everything to these 100 laptops, and it was an absolute nightmare. If our customers, if our users had a problem, I'd have to say to them, look, bring your laptop back into the office, and we'll fix it for you. So most of the time, people would be bringing these laptops back into the office. We'd fix it for them. About a week later, it'd break again. They'd have to bring it back in. We had no way of managing these devices over the air. We had no way of deploying anything to these devices. We had no way of securing them. So after a few months, I sort of said, right, OK, this is a crap idea. I'm sorry, what I'm going to do is implement an amnesty so everyone who's got a laptop can bring it back and we'll swap it for either a thin client or a PC. How many of those hundred users do you think said, yes, I'm going to bring my laptop back and I want to have a PC? 3.2. 3.2, exactly 3.2, Chris, well done. One person came back and said, yeah, you know what, I will swap this laptop for a PC and then he changed his mind a week later. This, this is the problem with laptops. Once you give someone a laptop, you are never, ever going to get them back onto a desktop. That has been my experience. Once somebody goes across to a laptop device, when someone embraces, and I mean, we're, we're here talking about this now. I'm pretty sure all of us use laptops 100% of the time. Okay, I've got a PC at home. What do you use? Go on, Jim. So I only use my laptop if I have to. Do you use a PC? I use a PC at home on my desk. So. Mechanical keyboard. Yeah. So. Yeah. That makes sense. So I've got a PC at home. 
that I plug my Oculus into and I play Half-Life, Alex. It's awesome. Sometimes I do work on it. Most of the time, I'm on a laptop, okay? And most of the people I talk to, they're on a laptop. And that's been my experience. You give someone a laptop, very difficult to take it off them because they, they want to use this thing. And I think that's the experience that everyone's had over the past three or four years or so. Okay, so you probably, probably remember there was a bit of a kerfuffle a couple of years ago um, with some sort of virus thing, okay? We all remember this, and hopefully we've moved on. I don't feel like I have today, I'll be honest. Um, and we saw a lot of stuff happening when this was going on, especially in the EUC world. I was at VMware at the time, and we had a lot of conversations around Horizon. We had a lot of conversations around Workspace One, remote working, all this cool stuff. The biggest winner when it came to remote working was probably laptops. Massively big winner. There was a shortage. There was a supply chain issue. They couldn't make these things fast enough. And when they did make these things, everyone went out and bought them. It was very, very difficult to get hold of laptops. One customer I was dealing with, local government, what we had to do to get them to work remotely is let them use BYO devices, devices they already had, and let them connect into their existing PCs in the office. That was the quickest way to get them access because you just couldn't get hold of laptops. There was a massive shortage. I think we're out of that now. And part of this was driven by a lot of different organizations going out there and buying laptops. DWP is a good example. So I did um, a webinar with someone from the DWP probably about two and a half years ago now when all this was kicking off. And they said, look, if you've gone to DWP um, probably February 2020 and said, hey, you're about to buy 70,000 laptops, you would have been left out of the room. Then obviously a month later, that's pretty much exactly what they did. And this is publicly available information. So we've got 28,000 uh, employees with workspace devices. CC were building 1,500 laptops per day. They did 59,000 builds of new devices. Most of that was on laptops. Okay. So now we have, out in the market, and this has been happening oh, probably for the past 10, 15 years or so, out in the market, lots and lots of laptops, lots of users using laptops. Luckily, we've got some solutions to cater for laptops now. We're no longer in the world of Windows 7. We've got some really powerful capabilities. One of the interesting stats that's come out reasonably recently, and this is a sort of a fresh June 2023 stat, is when you're looking at laptops, when you're looking at enterprises, when you're looking at the market, it's not just, it's not very high contrast, I'm sorry. It's not just Windows devices out there. Depending on the territory, a third of the devices out there are going to be Mac. That took me by surprise. But that's one of the things I'm hearing a lot from the market over the past couple of years. Mac, Apple as a service, is massively growing. You see Windows, you see Mac devices, you see a whole mix of endpoint devices out there. So where does this tie into what Liquid does? First off, I don't know if you've seen this before. I've shown it to a few people. This is where I see the modern workspace landscape, okay? And I've protested this with a lot of different organizations, vendors, partners, customers over the past couple of years. So basically, we've got virtual desktops, analytics, app management, access, and device management. Where we play is here, okay? The piece that I'm going to be talking about today is the Liquid piece here, application portal and access, delivery and config, application lifecycle management, and especially UEM, Unified Endpoint Management. Realistically, when we're talking about UEM, we're talking about two vendors in this space. We're talking about Intune from Microsoft, and we're talking about Workspace ONE from VMware. Okay, is anyone from VMware in the room? Perfect, excellent. We love Workspace ONE. So, moving on, I'm going to talk more about Intune today. Okay, don't worry about that, I'll do a separate session. This, this is where I see where we fit with Intune. Intune is absolutely brilliant when it comes to managing the endpoint device, when it comes to enrollment, when it comes to deployment of the operating system in the first, oh, first off, when it comes to securing the endpoint device. Where we come in and where Liquid is really, really strong is deploying those applications. It's full application lifecycle management. I'm gonna show you how this works, okay? I'm gonna focus on an example here, okay? So um, out-of-box enrollment. So typical out-of-box enrollment would look something like this. So you've got an endpoint device, you turn it on. You sign in with your Azure AD account. That then uh, enrolls you into Intune. Intune then pushes down the payloads, all the different configuration files. What then happens with Liquid is Liquid can then take over and then deploy the applications. And we do this in a number of different ways. Um, and some cool stuff I'm gonna show you very shortly. But first off, I'm gonna show you a canned demo, I recorded this, there's reasons why I recorded this, I can't remember what they are, but it's a video. Don't you agree with that guy? Should I have done it live? How's your tea? Good. Right. So, so this is virtual machine, okay, and this is a virtual machine running Windows 11. Windows 11 is now starting up for first boot. This is really poor contrast, isn't it? So first boot, you've all seen this before. What I'm going to do is sign into Azure AD using my Azure AD credentials. 
Um, and again, you've all seen this before, but I'm going to show you some cool stuff. So here we go. So this is my demo account, ben at theworkhub.co.uk. If you want to check out some interesting blogs, some interesting blogs, go to theworkhub.co.uk. Uh, I'm signing in. So we all know what's going to happen here, okay? So you sign in using your uh, Azure AD credentials into Windows 11. It's going to enroll itself against Intune. What happens then is pretty interesting because what will happen is Intune will then push down payloads, configuration payloads. Um, those configuration payloads can be whatever you tell it to be. In this case, I'm pushing out an Intune Win file, the only one you ever have to push out if you're using Liquid, which is the Agent Bootstrapper. What this does is it gets deployed to the endpoint. It will then execute the Agent Bootstrapper, which will then pull down the Liquid agent from the tenant, and then when that's there, it will then start to deploy applications. This is what it looks like, okay? So it drops you onto the desktop first time. You can see we've got the agent running there, the liquid agent. This is now talking to the tenant. The tenant has been told to talk to through the config, through the agent bootstrapper. It will then start to pull down applications you've decided to deploy as a first run set of applications. And it will do all of this automatically. User logs on, applications get deployed. I'm going to show you what this looks like. You've all seen applications deployed previously. So if we click on uh, here, I'm going to show you what a deployment looks like. So this is putting down a pre-canned deployment. So if we go down here, click on Demo, click on Packages, what I'm installing here for demo purposes is Wireshark and Google Chrome. Do you have so, dark mode? Sorry? Do you have dark mode? Close your eyes. Ah. So we have connectors as well, so you have the concept of an app store. So you go into the app store, go into resources, you can see some of our 4,000 different applications that we have available. We are doing some very cool stuff with this. Part of this is currently OEM'd to VMware. We're doing some other interesting stuff that I'm not allowed to talk about. So here, here's Wireshark. This is how I'd grab Wireshark. In this case, I've already grabbed it, made it available. It's been pulled down. It's been deployed onto this desktop. The same with Chrome. So if I go down here, you'll see Wireshark. Perfect. Click on Wireshark. It's going to launch. Of course, it's going to launch because it's been pulled down. It's been installed. It's there as part of the initial deployment, um, part of the initial deployment of this laptop because we used Intune to do the deployment. Great, so that's Wireshark. We've also got Chrome that's been deployed as well. So again, very, very straightforward. I can just go to Chrome, I can click on Chrome, and then Chrome gets installed. Uh, sorry, Chrome runs because it's already installed. The next thing that happens here is that as soon as the applications are installed, it will then sing you, single sign you on to the Liquid Launcher. So you're still using your Azure AD credentials, it will sign you on, it will give you access to self-service applications. So all the applications that you wanted to be deployed initially are already deployed. So if I click on Wireshark, that's already installed. That's been done as part of the um, autopilot, part of the out-of-box enrollment initially. Click on that, it's installed. But some of these applications are going to be just in time. They're going to be self-service apps. So if I click on Teams, what that's going to do then is install Teams locally because that's part of the automation that you want to have in place. Um, that's going to take a while because that's quite a big package. But also Notepad++, smaller package. I'm going to click on that. What that will do is install it and then launch it. So these are the applications you'd tend to see if you wanted the user to, one, have um, pre-installed applications, pre-seeded applications, and then you have the self-service applications that you can just click on, and then they'll appear and be installed. And all of this is completely controllable. We can also do exactly the same thing with Mac. So all the applications you've just seen, you can also deploy to Mac. You can put a lot of automation around this as well. So if I sign into the Liquid Launcher, and we're going to do some cool stuff, and I'll show you that. Um, the sign into Liquid Launcher using my AD um, credentials, then I can find my applications, I can click on my applications, and I can install my applications. If I have SaaS applications, or if I want to deploy SaaS applications, then this will single sign you onto those SaaS applications too. So you can see here, if I click on Excel, I don't think Excel is currently installed. So if I click on Excel, what's going to happen is the first thing it will do is install the Mac package, and then it will launch Excel. And you can change, in my last presentation, I went through how you can change what happens when a user clicks on one of these applications. And it will do that in real time. And this time, very straightforward, click on the application, it will install the application, and then it will run the application. OK? Very straightforward. Um, so there you go. Excel. Ooh, Excel. Very exciting. So one of the other things that we're about to bring in, we've got something very cool, OK? It's, what you turn. We've got, um, one minute, we've got feedback.liquid.com, which is our roadmap. We made that publicly available. If you want to see what we're working on, what we're developing, it's right there. One of the really cool things that we're doing is we're introducing Bootstrapper for Mac. So you can do full out-of-box enrollment using Intune, get your applications deployed to Mac exactly the same as you would with Windows. This will absolutely cater for Windows or absolutely cater for Mac devices. As I said, depending on the geo, depending on the territory, 30% of all endpoints especially laptop endpoints, are heading towards being Mac-based endpoints. So you need to be able to consider those endpoints whenever you're talking about application deployment. Adam. So you've made it really easy to get users to apps, um, but how do you handle licensing management where you have limited licensing? For the I'll cover that separately, but we do have the ability of tra to track licensing. This isn't Snow, okay? This isn't like a full-on asset management solution, but we do give you the ability to be able to track licensing. And what about reclamation of apps that are being used? 
We can do that. What we have is a lot of integration to third-party tools that will give you the ability to do that. But again, I'll show you some of this stuff afterwards, if that's all right, Adam. Perfect. We're going to make it all right, aren't we? So we also have integrations with Workspace ONE. Again, that's a separate piece. I'm not going to cover too much here. Workspace ONE will do native Win32 application deployment, which is why I've made these sort of green and blue. Using our solution, we will do all of this in the blue, including the application repository, dynamic application uh, configuration. One last thing I want to show you is this. So, and this came from a request from Keith. So we can also use the Liquid Launcher on non-desktop type um, operating systems, non-desktop devices. So in this case, this is uh, an iPad, and this video doesn't want to play. So oh, here we go. This is an iPad, okay? So you go into the launcher, in this case, benwar.liquid.com. You can simply go through the application catalog. You can find, in this case, let's say, Excel Web. Click on Excel Web. It then becomes self-service application. Click on Get. That appears in my workspace. I can then click on that application. That application will launch, and I'll be single signed on. Okay, quite a sort of table stakes capability, but we can do this. We don't do native mobile device application management, okay? But we can give you access to SaaS. We can give you access to sort of virtual Windows application type capabilities if you're using AVD Citrix or Parallels or um, VMware in the back end. We can do that. So now I was going to ask some questions. Any questions? If you want a demo environment, scan this. We'll get you a demo environment. Any questions? Am I on time? You are. I'm on time. Perfect. Excellent. Okay, great stuff. <laughs>